This is the second part of the chapter 10. Okay, class 12 biology, chapter 10, microbes and human welfare, right? And uh, look at this digestive system of the cow. Okay, it has multiple chambers in the stomach. And one of them is called rumen. We don't have to learn other chambers. This is called rumen. In the rumen, you find a bacteria. This is a symbiotic bacteria that lives in the rumen of the, the cow. Okay. And what's the use of, uh, what's the name of this bacteria? This bacteria is known as methanogen. Okay. Methanogen or there's another name called methanobacterium. Name of the bacteria is commonly we called collectively. The different species we call them methanogen or methanobacterium. Okay, it's the most common methanogen. And what does it do? In the why is it living there? <clears throat> uh, the food eaten by the cow contains mostly cellulose. And, uh, you know, cellulose needs an enzyme called cellulase to be to digest the cellulose. An enzyme is required, cellulase. And in fact, these animals don't have cellulase. So what the bacteria is doing, it helps the animal to digest cellulose. This is a basic function of methanogen, right? Digestion of cellulose. Once cellulose is digested, it, it has turned into simple molecules. We don't need those explanations. For example, you know, acetate, butyrate, but we don't learn that. And one of the byproduct of this digestion is CH4, methane. Another byproduct is hydrogen. Another byproduct is carbon dioxide. Okay, we are doing the second part of uh, chapter 10. And this bacteria lives in rumen of the cow. What's the rumen? It's one of the chambers of the stomach. It has five different chambers, right? And uh, uh, this is called rumen. In the rumen, you find a bacteria, the common name of bacteria. Collectively, all the bacteria living there are known as methanogen. And one such specific bacteria is methanobacterium. You call them methanogen or methanobacterium because they have the ability to produce methane. And why do they live in the, uh, in the rumen of these animals? Because these animals eat cellulose. And the bacteria helps the animal to digest the cellulose into simple molecules. During digestion of cellulose to simple molecules, Two, three byproducts are formed. Okay, these are gases: CH4, methane, hydrogen gas, and carbon dioxide. Okay, and remember the name of the bacteria. These are known as methanogens. Another place where you find this bacteria is in sewage. Okay, in the what is sewage? The wastewater in the drainage is called sewage. Even in this, you find the, this bacteria. And you also find them in decomposing organic matter. You know, uh, the places where rice is go grown, the rice fields are filled with water, or you can call them paddy fields. These places, you know, in India, we might be familiar with such places. Rice is grown in water, in muddy water, you know, muddy fields. And there's a lot of decomposition happening. And even there you find methanogens. So methanogens might live inside the, uh, the digestive system of the uh, cattle or it could be living in the sewage outside independently or it could be in the rice fields. In anywhere there's decomposition of organic matter. But all these places, they do produce methane, hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Okay. Right, and we are going to use the bacteria to produce something called biogas. Okay, even in class 10, you have studied about biogas, right? <clears throat> this is a biogas plant. 
to produce biogas, what's the raw material you need? The basic raw material you need is the cow dung. And in the previous slide, you have seen there is a bacteria living in the digestive system of the cow, the rumen. And along uh, with the feces of the cow, which is a cow dung, the bacteria comes out. That means methanogens are located in the dung of the cow. And that means decomposition continues, production of methane continues, even outside the body of the animal. Right? So, raw material for biogas production is the cow dung. Okay. So, the, after collecting the cow dung, you need to mix it in water. Okay? There are specific volumes and ratios which we won't be discussing. So, this is cow dung plus water. Right? This mixture is called slurry. Why do they turn it into slurry? Because it's easy to handle it, you know, or feed into the biogas plant. Okay, And biogas plant consists of, what do you find? Remember, this is your ground level, level of the soil. Now, that's a pit, you see? If you look at this, this is basically a pit dug into the soil. See, this is a pit dug into the soil. And in this pit, there are two connections. One is going up. Here you can see a connection, right? This is connected to another pit here, smaller one. Okay. Then there's another connection over here. And this is connected to one more pit. Okay. This is the deepest one. And it's lined with brick and cement. That means if you put uh, the cow dung slurry into this pit, it will stay there. It won't sink into the soil. Remember, this is uh, lined with brick and cement. It, it's plastered. So nothing can leak out from this. Okay? Like on the at the bottom, they put concrete. Okay? So everything is secured and uh, the fluid cannot escape from the well. And this part is known as a digester. It's a digester of the biogas plant. And on the top of the biogas plant, you find a dome. This dome is movable. Means what? It can go up. When the pressure of the gas increases, it goes up. It's literally floating on the surface of this. And uh, the space between is very close. Okay, So it makes sure that gases don't escape. This is to collect the gas. When the gas bubbles from here, the gas gets collected inside. As the gas gets collected, due to the pressure of the gas, the dome keeps rising. But it can't get out of this because there is a locking system which prevents it from leaving the biogas plant. So it's a movable dome. It's called gas holder. And gas holder has an exit pipe which is connected to the kitchen. Okay, And there's a special uh, gas stove if it's kitchen. You can use the gas for producing electricity. How? Okay, there are special type of methane gas burners which uses methane gas to generate electricity. There are special lamps which can be, uh, you know, lit with this gas. Okay, multiple use of this, but most common use in the kitchen for cooking. Okay, so this is how the whole biogas plant is set up. Okay, this. This pit, let's call it pit A, and that's a pit B. In the pit B, what do they put? They put the slurry. Okay? Slurry is a mixture, mixture of uh, these two things. Cow dung and the water are mixed together, excreta of the cattle. And what's the Hindi name of this? It's given in the reader. It's called gober, gober gas. Okay, gober means the dung of the cattle. Cow dung is known as the gobble, right? And it contains what what do you find in the cow dung? You will find undigested cellulose. Where does cellulose come from? From the grass. In the rumen, right? Yeah, in the room. Okay, in the in the cow dung you find undigested cellulose, which is originated from the grass eaten eaten by the, the cow. And 
the methanogen, the bacteria will be using the cellulose present in the cow dung, right? Okay, so that's a slurry. Imagine you constructed a new, uh, new biogas plant. What's the first step? You need to fill it up, okay? Through this, the slurry is added until it is full, right? Once it is full, you just leave it for almost 15 to 30 days, okay? 15 to 30 days, there's not much activity. This During this period of time, the bacteria multiplies, increase in number, and by the end of maybe 20 or 25th day, you can see gas collection begins, right? Gas starts building up inside, the dome starts moving up slowly. That's an indication of gas production. And uh, as the pressure generates inside, you can keep adding more slurry, okay? And addition of more slurry and the pressure of the gas will push the spent slurry, okay? This is the spent slurry, which is also known as the sludge, okay? It's a spent slurry. It starts it starts coming out of out of the uh, the biogas plant. Okay, it starts leaving the biogas plant. So this is how the bio biogas plant functions. We don't need to learn the functioning, but instead you have to learn the name of the bacteria, what exactly happens inside. Inside you find uh, digestion of the cellulose by the methanogen happens. And that generates carbon dioxide, methane, and hydrogen. But you find more methane than other two gases. And uh, this gas is used as a fuel. Okay? And uh, this is known as the biogas plant. Okay. If you have any questions, please ask. All right. In India, we have... Uh, um, Indian Agriculture Research Institute. And there is something called Khadi and Village Industry Industries Commission. Okay? You have to learn these two because it's in the reader. Everything in the reader, they're, you memorize. They're like responsible for, for the biogas production, right? No. They are responsible for developing technology. You know, every year they keep improving the technology. Uh, you know, different aspects of the biogas plant, you know, they keep improving, right? That's their job. They don't uh, produce it and help uh, people to set up uh, the biogas plant at discounted prices by the government. Okay. And what's the use of the spent slurry? Used slurry is used as a manual. It's an excellent manual and uh, uh, this is used in the farm by the farmers to grow the crops. Okay, that's the next part. You might have heard about organic farm. Okay, this is like a representation of organic farm. That means what is conventional farm? What is conventional farm? In conventional farming, we use fertilizers, which are chemicals. In conventional farming, you know, today's most of the farming is called conventional farm. No, the regular farming, that's use of fertilizer. And in conventional farming, they use pesticides. They use insecticides. Why? To kill the pest. Any kind of pest, insect pest or animal pest, rats, everything is killed using these chemicals. And what's wrong with these chemicals? These chemicals are toxic to animals as well as humans. So when you spray the pesticides and insecticides on the crop, these chemicals get into the crop produce. For example, if you have like fruits harvested from a tree, in the fruits you find residues of these pesticides and chemicals. And if it's like a vegetable, in the vegetable you find this. Okay, that's one disadvantage. Second problem, these pesticides and chemicals enter the food chain. 
from the soil, from the plant, it enters the food chain and it ends up in humans. And it causes pollution. Okay, water gets polluted. It will kill animals, fish in the water, right? And uh, this, these are disadvantages of conventional farming. So what scientists suggest today, we should switch to organic farming. Okay, so in organic farming, they don't use fertilizer. Instead, they use manure. What's manure? It's decomposed organic waste. Okay, for example, you know, cow dung is a very good manure. And if you go to a farm, what do they do? They put all the uh, remains of plants and animals and cow dung in a pit and cover it with soil. And after a month or two, it decomposes and form manure. So it's decomposed parts of plants and animals and mostly cow dung. So this is to replace fertilizer. And they don't use pesticides. But the question is, if they don't use pesticides, how they can control the pest? Okay, So they use uh, a technique called biological pest control. Okay, What is that? I'll give you a simple example, you know, to understand the idea of biological pest control, right? Suppose you have, uh, one day you got up and you found out that there are too many rats in your house. You have two options. You can use uh, chemical poisons, okay? These chemical poisons you can buy, mix it with food and just leave it overnight as like a trap. And you can get rid of the rats. But over a period of time, rats develop resistance to this. You cannot kill the rats anymore after a few years, right? And it can be eaten by other animals too, like uh, maybe cats or dogs, and they also die from this. That's the first choice. Now, second choice is you can bring few cats home. Get few cats, okay? Very ferocious, wild cats. Not the pet ones, you know. They don't uh, catch the rats. You know, the naturally seen, you know, wild ones. In India, you can see them. Bring them home, okay, and keep them at your home for a few days. So what the cats do? They keep eating the rats. They kill the rats and finish them off. Are you using any chemicals here? No. But you're using a predator, to control a pest. So in this case, our problem is a rat. Rat is a pest. And we don't want to use the chemicals. So what we do? We use the predator of the rat to control the number of rats. This approach is called biological pest control. So in biological pest control, scientists study and find out the predators of the pest. Increase them in number and release them in a field. Okay, this is the idea of biological pest control. Now the question is, what will happen to the cats? And uh, for example, if you don't want the cats anymore, don't feed them, they just leave the place. If you don't give the food to the cats, they, when the rats run out, they will move to another place looking for food. Okay, similarly, in biological pest control, they select a predator, which can effectively kill the prey. And once the prey is uh, gone, what happens to the predator? They die out. Okay? And again, they breed such predators inside controlled conditions and release them in the field. This approach is known as biological pest control. And through biological pest control, you can stop using pesticides and insecticides. And they replace fertilizers with manure. Okay, fertilizers are uh, replaced with manure. And that will reduce uh, water pollution and it maintains healthy soil. Okay, and uh, we have some examples to study here on about biological pest control. Okay, there are some bio biocontrol agents. Biocontrol agents, right? 
And one of them is a bacteria known as bacillus. Okay. Thuringiensis. It's a bacteria. And the short form of this is B T. Okay. Take B and T. Remember, right? This this bacteria will be talking about this bacteria again in a chapter called biotechnology. Okay, Bt bacteria, and uh, this bacteria produce a protein known as crystal protein, and the the short form is cry protein. It doesn't make the insects cry; rather, this crystal proteins. Uh, make holes on the intestine of the caterpillar, of the pest, of the insect, holes on the intestinal wall, intestinal wall of insect pest. Okay? On the intestinal wall of insect pest. Right? So, what happens to insect? They die. As the in insect's intestine become leaky, they cannot digest and absorb the food, and that's how the the insect dies. Okay, remember, insect pests are killed. Only insect specific group of insect pests are killed by this particular bacteria. So, what scientists do? This bacteria is available in the form of dried spores, and you can buy it in the form of sachet. Okay, a powder. Mix it with water. You have to mix it with water and spray it on your crop. Right? What will be your crop? Okay? Like uh, maybe brassicas. Brassicas are like cabbage, um, you know, mustard and cauliflower. And you can spray it on any kind of fruit trees which are eaten by insect larvae. Okay, so what insects do? Insects might lay eggs on the on the leaves of these plants. Then the larvae come out. They feed on the parts of the plant, right? When they start feeding on the parts of the plant, the insect larvae. You might have, if you remember, we call them caterpillar. Okay, during the life cycle of insect, what the insect pests do? Insect pests lay eggs on the leaves. Eggs hatch into caterpillar. It's the caterpillars that eat up the leaves, eat up the fruits, eat up the cabbage, etc. And when they start eating the parts of the plant with the bacteria spores sprayed, they are taking in the bacteria. Bacteria produces this crystal protein. And in the gut of the larvae, the toxin, which is crystal protein, make holes on the wall and uh, that kills the caterpillars, right? And once they are killed, that whole new generation of insect is gone. So it takes some time for the insect population to die out. But we, do, we don't use any kind of chemicals here. Okay, What will happen to the bacteria? It's harmless to other animals and humans. So it doesn't cause uh, any problem. So there's a new approach for this. Scientists have developed through biotechnology crops with the BT gene. Okay, They took the gene from the bacteria which produces crystal toxin and put, the, put it inside. Put it inside the cells of the crop. So for example, there's a variety of cotton. It's called BT cotton. In the cells of BT cotton, the toxin is produced by the plant itself. It's a genetically modified plant. Okay, we'll study it in biotechnology, how it is being done. There's no harm for any other insect. Other insects are not, uh, not harmed by the uh, toxin. Okay, so this is uh, known as a biocontrol agent. What's the name of this? Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a name of uh, a bacteria. And remember the name of the protein. The crystal is called crystal protein. Crystal protein is a name of the toxin produced by 
this chapter we don't have to learn the crystal protein but we'll de uh, learn it in chapter 12 biotechnology but in this chapter we just call it a toxin okay hope you understood this the first example for biological control okay it's a biological control agent bio control agent what is it bacillus thuringiensis or b Look at this. This is an insect known as aphid. Aphids are like mosquitoes, you know. What the mosquitoes do with humans? Mosquitoes drink our blood. It drinks our blood. Imagine a million mosquitoes sit on your body and keep drinking the blood. It will be disastrous, right? Similarly, this is exactly like mosquitoes of uh, the plant. And you can see a sting of the insect, can you see a sting? Like the mosquito has a sting, it has a sting. See, that's a sting. And how do mosquitoes find out our capillaries? Like uh, it has like uh, heat sensors, you know, it knows where exactly is a capillary. Similarly, it can find out the flow of the plant. What do you find in the flow of the plant? You find amino acid and you find sugar. Sugar is used for energy by the aphid, amino acid for growth. This is how the insect feed on the plant. And plants, unlike humans, I mean, if a mosquito bites us, we take measures to uh, get rid of the mosquito. We try to kill the mosquito or move away from the place. But in this case, plants can't do anything. Thousands of aphids keep drinking the phloem sap and that kills the plant. So this is actually a pest what is it it is an insect pest what is it insect pest okay and uh, such insect pests can be controlled using uh, the biological control okay biological control can be used to kill such insect pest okay so what's the biological control for this one Look at this. Scientists found out that, you know, you're familiar with this bug. Okay, it's a ladybug. Right, reddish in color, maybe brownish, slight variation. They found out that ladybug feeds on aphid. It's a predator. So what scientists do? Scientists do, they breed large number of ladybugs and release them in a farm where there are too many aphids and they feed on the ladybugs feed on the aphids get rid of them and their number keeps increasing until the aphids come down when the aphids come down the ladybugs move out they just fly away to another place looking for more food right so this is biological control you're not using any chemicals but you're using a predator this is actually a predator of the insect, aphid. Okay? And it co effectively controls the aphid. Look at the Bt, the bacillus, crystal protein, the spore of the bacteria. Okay? And in the uh, intestine of the larvae, I'm just showing you this. We don't have to memorize it. Uh, this might help you to understand it better, that's all. When the larvae eat the leaf, see, this is the leaf. It's nibbling on the leaf. When it eats a leaf, the spore and the spore of the bacteria with the crystal protein gets in. It gets activated. You know, the to it becomes activated toxin. And once it becomes activated, it makes holes on the intestine. Okay? And the spores, what the spores do? A spore contain inactive bacteria. So when you spray the spores on the plant, the caterpillar is consuming the bacteria. They multiply in the intestine, release more toxin. Toxin will stick to the lining of the gut, make holes on the gut. And this is how the, the insect caterpillar, you know, the worms of the insect are killed. Larvae of the insect are killed by the Bt toxin.
That's a fungus called trichoderma. Okay, trichoderma is a fungus. It's a free living fungus. And you can find them growing on uh, the roots of the plant. You know, so we know root. Let's say this is the root. On the root, there are root hairs. What's the function of the root hair? Root hair helps to absorb. Root hair helps to helps to absorb um, water and mineral ions, right? And this is uh, a type of fungus which grows around the root. See? Okay, so it can help the plant to absorb the nutrients like phosphorus. We'll study it in the biofertilizer, but more than that. It prevents the growth of other harmful pathogens, you know, disease-causing pathogens on the root. It's like a protective layer around the root. It forms a protective layer around the root. This is called, what do you call this? Fungus. This is a biocontrol agent, biological control agent. It's a free-living fungus. And most of the uh, if there are plants living, you find them associated with the roots. And what does it do? It, it's like a defensive layer. Stop the pathogens from attacking the root. So what uh, farmers do? They spread the spores of the fungus in the soil before planting a crop. And after spreading the spores, it's available in the, in the market in the form of granules. We can, they can just throw it in the soil wait for a few days, and then plant the crop. When, when you plant the crop, the fungus spread out, grows a protective layer around the root and protect it from many pathogens, Okay, any pathogens that might affect the root system. Okay, so this is Another biocontrol agent. This is called baculoviruses. Okay, these are uh, these are actually viruses. What do they do? They attack insects, and it also attack many arthropods. It attacks insects and many arthropods. Right, and what the baculoviruses do? They cause diseases in these insects. And remember, these are the pests. Those are the pests. Okay, baculoviruses are the pests, and these pests. Okay, the, what do they do? These pests kill insects and many arthropods. You no know, arthropods means all kinds of insects. They are the biggest problem for the plant. Cause diseases in them and kill them. So baculoviruses are pathogens. Pathogens that attack insects and other arthropods. Okay. And there's a, a group of baculoviruses. And this is called nucleo. Okay. Poly. Okay. I'm just breaking it up. Nucleo poly. Hedro. Virus. Okay. Nucleo polyhedrovirus. That's a class of virus. And it's a group of virus. Okay. Nucleo polyhedrovirus. These are used as uh, species specific. They are specific to the uh, species of arthropods and insects, but they have no effect on uh, humans or any other mammal. So, what do you have to do? Use, you can buy this virus in the form of a powder. Mix it in water and just spray it on the leaves of the plant. Virus stick, virus stick to the leaves. That's the viral particle sticking to the leaf. When the insect larva feeds on the leaf, the virus gets inside. And the what the virus does? Virus infect the cells of the uh, animal, the caterpillar, and kill the virus. Okay, and this is how nucleo polyhedroviruses kill the insect. And what do you call baculoviruses? So nucleo polyhedroviruses, biological control agents, biocontrol agents. They have no uh, negative effect on any uh, other species like um, plants, 
animals, any form of other animals, mammals, uh, birds, fish, or even other insect. You no, know, it attacks only specific species of insect. Okay, right. And uh, this kind of pest management in which they use biological agents is called IPM. What's IPM? Integrated Pest Management Program. Okay, what is it? Integrated Pest Management Program. This helps the ec ecosystem. We reduce the pollution. We don't kill uh, other insects. Suppose you spray a pesticide. Honeybees die. Butterflies die. Pests also die. But when you do this approach, you save useful insects. Because these are uh, species-specific pathogens. These are species-specific pathogens. And these pathogens don't kill the useful uh, insects. Okay, so this these are known as baculoviruses or nucleopolyhedroviruses. Okay, now look at biofertilizers, right? So biofertilizers replace the common fertilizer. So, so if you understand, what's a fertilizer? Fertilizers are usually chemicals. Okay, I'll give you an example. You know, ammonium nitrate. Ammonium nitrate is a fertilizer. Okay, you might have heard about urea. It's a fertilizer. Potassium uh, sulfate. It's a fertilizer. These are chemicals. And they damage the soil, number one. Okay, soil gets ruined. Soil becomes too salty. Uh, salts accumulate in the soil pH become either acidic or alkaline. And fertilizers kill earthworms. Fertilizers kill decomposers in the soil. We need decomposers in the soil. But they are killed by these chemicals. So, plus, they are leached into the water and they cause pollution. These are the problems of chemical fertilizers. That's why scientists started looking for uh, alternative, right? Sources of nutrients for the plants. One of them is manure. We studied about manure. Manure is obtained from decomposing parts of plants or animals. Uh, or you can use uh, gobel, means cow dung. Okay, that's uh, manure. But it's difficult to handle. That's a disadvantage of, and it's, it causes a lot of smell. That's a disadvantage of manure. But in biofertilizers, they use microorganisms. They might they use they might use bacteria. They might use fungi. Okay, and there's a specific bacteria called cyanobacteria, blue green algae. For class eleven, you have done this. Blue green algae. Okay, blue green algae. So, biofertilizers are basically microorganisms which are used for supplying nutrients for the plants. Okay, you have studied about, you know, in the root nodules of plants, if you look at the root nodule, what's the root nodule? Swellings on the root of legumes. What's a legume? Beans. All plants like soya bean, you know, red beans, uh, black eyed peas, anything, any kind of beans. And if you look at the roots of the beans, you can find root nodule. Okay, you can find root nodule. Inside the root nodule, what do you find? There's a bacteria. This bacteria is called rhizobium. Name of the bacteria is rhizobium, right? And this bacteria fixes nitrogen gas for the plant and supply the nitrogen gas for forming amino acid, right? So this is like a, this relationship is called symbiotic relationship. What is symbiosis? It's a relationship in which two organisms live together and they benefit each other. They're like best friends. You know, best friends, even you have best friends. 
and best friends always help each other. Okay, so this is symbiotic association between rhizobium and the legumes. What's a legume? Beans. And again, class 11, you studied this in detail, but we don't need it here. Right? And nitrogen gas is fixed up, uh, taken up by the bacteria, and they turn it into uh, useful compounds like amino acids, you know, ammonium ions and become amino acids. Okay. And this is symbiotic bacteria. What's the name of bacteria? Rhizobi. But there are free living bacteria in the soil. Okay. For example, Azospirillum. These names you have to memorize. Azospirillum and Azobacterium. Azospirillum and Azobacteria are free living nitrogen fixing bacteria. Okay, free living nitrogen fixing bacteria. And if, that means if you add these bacteria to the soil, what happens to the fertility of the soil? It increases. But this one is inside the root nodule. Okay, they get into the root nodules from the soil. They live in the soil. And you can, if you can add spores of the bacteria to the soil, and if you are growing a legume, then it's really helpful for the legume, right? For other plants, non-legumes, only legumes are root nodules. Other plants, they for other crops, they use free-living nitrogen-fixing bacteria, azospirillum and azobacteria. These are two free-living bacteria, and they are uh, they are used for increasing the nitrogen content of the soil. Okay, remember ni why nitrogen is required for the plants. Nitrogen is required for the formation of protein and growth. It's the most important mineral ion. Okay. So what do you call like uh, azospirillum and azo azobacteria? They are known as uh, they are known as biofertilizers because it increases the amount of uh, nitrogen in the soil. Okay. There's another one which is known as cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria. Cyano means blue. Okay. Cyan means blue. Blue green algae is called this. This bacteria is called blue-green algae. They have the ability to fix nitrogen. They have, you know, they are green, bluish green, so they can do photosynthesis. Okay, this is autotrophic. Remember, means it's like algae. It's between algae and the bacteria. So cyanobacteria, and there are many uh, cyanobacteria. For example. One example is anabena. It's a cyanobacteria. Okay. Anabena. It's a nostoc. It's a cyanobacteria. Oscillatoria. The oscillatoria. Right. These names actually are done in classification. But if you don't remember, it's okay. Don't think about that now. Just learn these three names. Anabena, nostoc, oscillatoria. What are they? These are cyanobacteria. Different species of blue-green algae. And what is azospirillum and azobacteria? These are free-living nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the soil. What is rhizobium? It's a nitrogen-fixing bacteria which lives inside the root nodule of specific plants known as legume. So if you add these bacterial spores to the soil, what will happen? Uh, the plants can grow better. They get more nitrogen. Okay, Plants can grow better. They get more nitrogen because they can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. That means you don't have to use these nitrate fertilizers. Right? When you don't use nitrate fertilizer, it actually improves the soil. Okay? I told you the disadvantage of these fertilizers. Okay? But when you use these things, uh, it's unlike manure. And manure is bulky and it's smelly and difficult to produce. Unlike those things, here you find it's compact, it's easy to spread and more, more effective than fertilizers as well as manure. And there's no harmful effect on the soil. Hope you understood. These are known as 
bio bio means what living living fertilizers and what are these fertilizers chemical fertilizers right so there's a difference between the regular fertilizer and bio fertilizer it's living because we use maybe bacteria or fungi okay bacteria here the examples we took all of them are bacteria okay we'll take an example of uh, example of fungi have you understood this right learn the names these names of species you have to memorize okay all right let's uh, take an example for the fungus okay look at a fungus which is used as a bio fertilizer and in some plants as i discussed in the previous one previous slide you will find fungal hyphae growing around it okay there's a thick layer same ex exactly like the previous one these are known as mycorrhiza what is it mycorrhiza mycorrhiza is actually a symbiotic fungus what's the meaning of symbiosis like the best friends i told you you know in symbiosis the mycorrhiza get nutrients from the plants and and uh plant is benefited by the fungus both are mutually benefited so we call it symbiotic fungus okay and there's a genus of fungus known as glomus what is it glomus they they form mycorrhiza and how plant is benefited it helps the plant to absorb you know it actually absorbs water mineral iron especially phosphorus right from the soil and supply to the plant that's what it does and the fungus grows into the cells of the root and what does the fungus get fungus get sugar amino acid from the plant so both are e equally benefited okay plant is giving uh giving uh food to the fungus fungus gets food from the plant and what does the plant get plant get water and mineral ions especially phosphorus mainly phosphorus and the third benefit it also protect the plant from pathogens see it's a double benefit no other disease causing pathogen can affect this particular plant because it's protected by a covering of fungus symbiotic fungus this is called mycorrhiza what's the name of the genus the genus is glomus okay it's a fungus and they live in association with the roots of specific species and what do they do they hyphae of the fungus you know this is a fungal hyphae threads of the fungus form a thick layer around the root and this is actually a symbiotic relationship with the root and this relationship help the fungus to obtain sugar and amino acids from the plant and what does the plant get water and phosphorus from the soil and the next benefit second benefit there are two benefits for the plant second benefit the plant is protected from pathogens disease causing bacteria okay pathogens and these are known as bio another example for bio fertilizer and this, here the example is a fungus okay right and that's a root nodule as a uh, of legumes okay legumes of these root nodule that's the root system of the legume and those are the root nodule inside the root nodule what do you find there is bacteria there's bacteria present inside the root nodule root nodule contains bacteria okay what's the name of the bacteria rhizobium is it symbiotic yes why do you call it symbiotic because the bacteria get shelter bacteria get sugar amino acid from the plant plant gives it food and shelter and what does a plant get the nitrogen 
okay bacteria takes up the nitrogen from the atmosphere and supply it to the plant and they the the plant uses nitrogen for forming amino acids and proteins that's a blue green algae or cyanobacteria this is called what is it cyano bacteria okay this is known as cyanobacteria or blue green algae the blue green algae is grown in the soil they you know it's available now you can buy the uh, spores of this algae and before planting a crop the spores of bacteria or the fungus can be spread in the soil and then they wait for a few days and later they plant the crop in this way you don't have to put any fertilizer okay they multiply and increase in number. Okay, look at the mycorrhizae. And you have two, two uh, sets of uh, grass growing here. This is uh, without mycorrhizae. This is with mycorrhizae. See the difference in the growth of the plant. And that's a mycorrhizae visible, you know, the white uh, thing. Here you can see the root hair, but not much uh, mycorrhizae. With mycorrhizae, there's a tremendous growth. Okay? That's a cartoon showing the relationship. The fungus is in friendship with the roots of the tree. Okay, So this is called symbiosis. Remember, symbiosis means mutually benefiting. Okay? They are mutually benefiting. Okay, so we have completed the 